I want to open the Word of God tonight um, in a very familiar, maybe to some passage in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1 to 3. And I hope that this message is a real encouragement to you. I know that um, life is overwhelming these days and frustrating. There's all kinds of emotions um, surrounding our life right now. Um, But this is such a simple and direct encouragement to us from from God's word. So if you want to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, if you have it on your phone or in your Bible, that's where we're going to be. And uh, I'm just going to read the first few verses here. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I wonder if you're growing weary these days. I wonder if you're losing heart. This message is for you. So um, there's a lot of metaphors in the Bible about the Christian life. Um, There's metaphors of uh, of a Christian being a soldier. Uh, There's metaphors of Christians are being like a farmer who are disciplined. And um, even uh, the metaphor of being a wrestler, one who wrestles and struggles And then there are other ones like being in a family. We're children of God and God is our Father. Uh, One of the most common metaphors in the Bible for what it means to be a Christian is talked about a race, running in a race. And so the writer of this book is trying to encourage fellow believers who are feeling overwhelmed and even want to give up And he's saying to them, don't stop running the race. So this message is called, Run for Your Life. And so we learn right here in this passage that we are in a race. We're running in a race. We're not not walking. Have you noticed that Life is not a walk in the park. It's not, it's not a cakewalk. We, we can't be casual about our lives. Our lives are actually serious. We, the Bible tells us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion waiting to devour. We can't just be casual about life. We can't just be neutral. We can't just walk. The Bible tells us to be sober-minded, to be alert, to be awake. So we we cannot walk, but it also, we cannot sprint either. We can't sprint. So some of us, and I I used to, when I was younger in my faith, I was so passionate, like I just wanted to take on the world for Jesus. And I realized that my pace was not sustainable. I was sprinting for Jesus. But the thing is, when you sprint, have you ever sprinted? (laughs) <laughs> and eventually you lose your breath, your energy, and you just keel over, right? We're not told to sprint. There's someone who runs um, in our church, and he said this one time to me, because I like to run sometimes. Uh, but he says, when, whenever I see someone running past me when I'm jogging, he says, I just assume they're not running as long as I am. They're running a shorter distance than me because this, this man runs 
like 20K. That's his routine. So the Christian life, you guys, what I'm trying to say is it's a marathon. It's not a walk in the park. It's not a sprint either. Sometimes I think we misunderstand what it means to be radical for Jesus. Like you see people who are really radical. They're just, they go to a conference and they're just filled up with the Spirit and they just want to take on everything. And, and then yet there are parts of their life that are falling apart. The, the, the journey that we're called to live on is not, we have to redefine what radical looks like. When we, radical in the Bible is a long obedience in the same direction. It's a long journey of discipline and obedience. It's not a sprint. So is your pace sustainable? Where would you say you're at in your faith right now? Do you feel like maybe you've kind of come down to a light walk and maybe even some of you have just sit down and said, I'm done. Maybe you're just laying out on the track right now. Help. Me. <laughs> Help. And again, that's why this is written, to encourage us, to say, get up. And maybe some of you are so zealous and you're just tired of actually chasing spiritual mountaintops. Here's what I've discovered. Sometimes there are spiritual mountaintops, but a lot of life is a long obedience in the same direction. So there is, um, I was watching on YouTube um, this documentary that absolutely blew my mind. It was about the sand people of the Kalahari, Kalahari Desert. I hope I said that right. This is the last African tribe that hunts in the most traditional way. Uh, it's called the persistent hunt. And it's all about tracking and concentration. Essentially, these trackers and hunters, they don't fight with a weapon. They chase the animal down until the animal gets so exhausted that it gives up. And what I realized in that documentary is that we as humans, we are actually the most... Uh, we have the most endurance out of any other creature. Eight hours of running. Eight hours of chasing this beast that is so fast and so quick. And finally, he, he catches up to this animal and you just look in the eyes of this animal and they, they fall down on the ground. And essentially, he walks up to it and kills it. What I want to say and encourage you guys is that we, with Christ in us, we can run the race of endurance. Some of you feel like, I just don't think I can make it to the end of the week. I don't think sometimes I can make it to the end of the day. I want to tell you that there is way more endurance in you than you think. That you have within you a determination, a grit. I learned this leadership principle called grit. It's this book, and it, it was awesome because it, it talks about the most successful people in life. Uh, this was a, a psychological book. It wasn't a Christian book, but it was a study of the most successful people. And, and the writer says that the most successful people are actually the ones who they, they, they don't quit. They're just unwilling to quit. They're persistent. They're passionate. It's the ones, the ones who are the smartest and the most intelligent, they actually quit a lot sooner because they don't have grit. And as I was reading that, I was like, that is what it means to be a Christian. We are a people of grit because we're a people who don't give up. We're a people who keep going through every season. We're a people who don't sit down and fall over. We are running the race of endurance. So it tells us here that how are we supposed to run this race? And it gives us some instruction. It says, 
Since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. How are we going to run this race with endurance? You're not going to do it with heavy baggage on your back, as was mentioned earlier. If you carry heavy things, you're not going to make it very long on the journey. There's this story of a man who wanted to climb this mountain, and he wanted to bring everything with him. He brought his instrument. He brought all of his favorite foods. He brought all of his books. He had this huge bag and all of his carry-ons, and he was heading up this mountain, and he soon realized as he went up, there's no way I'm going to get up there with all this. And so someone who was observing him observed this trail of baggage that was left behind as he kept going up the mountain. If you are going to go up the mountain, which is life, you're going to have to tread very simply. You're going to have to lay off weights and sins in your life. For the people who the writer was writing this to, the weight was legalism. They were, he was writing to these people who were so caught up in the legalism of the Jewish customs. But I wonder, like, what does it mean for us? What are our weights that we carry as people today? Just to name a few, we carry a heavy weight of mental health. I think we carry a weight of of loss. Many of you, some of you have lost a job. Some of you aren't able to find a job. Some of you have, you feel like your dreams have been crushed. So we carry that weight. And then there's the cultural conversations that we're in. I don't even want to mention them, but here we go. Masks, no masks. Open, don't open. Online church, in-person church. Black lives matter, all lives matter. Republican, Democrat. Is Jesus going to return or is he not going to? We are bombarded with information we are in a polarized world where we are forced to choose one or the other and people who study social media say that our brains are actually not even supposed to take in the amount of information that we're taking no wonder we're stressed out so i want to ask you what is what are the weights that you're carrying that you need to throw off because the problem is as you enter these debates and these conversations do you know what happens your soul starts to get corrupted you start to get become an angry person and satan is sitting in the background the roaring lion who is waiting to devour is chuckling because he's seeing people divided. He's seeing people become angry. He's seeing people become bitter. And who loses in the end? We do. Because we've taken our eyes off of the prize and on to the things of this world and we're carrying these weights that we were never intended to carry. There's a passage in the Bible that says, guard your heart for out of it everything flows. What are you allowing into your heart? It also says, throw off weight and, it throw, and throw off sin, the sin that so easily entangles. I just, I love and appreciate the honesty of the Bible. He's saying, I want you to throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, we're, we struggle with sin. The writer here is saying, it just easily entangles us. Do you notice that in your life? Wow, how easy is it to go the wrong way than the right way? It's just easy because we have this flesh. We're so corrupted by sin. And maybe some of you in this in this time of pandemic, you have gone down some dark roads of patterns and behaviors in your life that maybe didn't, weren't there before. The 
The Bible is so honest with us. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I wonder tonight if tonight's the time where you need to confess sin that has entangled you. The word literally means like you're all caught up in it. You're, you don't know up from down because you're just, you're caught up in it. You ever notice when you have headphones and you put them in your pocket and you pull them out and it takes you like 10 minutes to untangle it? How, how does that happen? I always wonder, like, how does that happen? It just, it was just there in my pocket. But that is how sin is. It's just, it easily entangles our life. And the next thing we know, we're just caught up in it. I mean, to lay that aside, you guys, if we're going to run the race with perseverance. What I love about this passage is that it talks about the cloud of witnesses. And when I, I used to read this passage and go, oh, the cloud of witnesses. Moses and Abraham, they're, they're in heaven and they're looking down and cheering me on. Go, Jeremy. That's how I used to think of this passage. But no, if you go one chapter back in chapter 11, it's this list of the hall of faith. It's men and women who endured persecution, endured the pain, endured failure, endured all kinds of suffering, and yet they did not give up because they believed that there was something worth living for. There was something worth dying for. And so when it says, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let, off throw, let us throw off everything. It's saying, you're not alone in your struggle. There are people who have gone before you who have endured similar things. So let that encourage you. 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. There's a lady who sent me, uh, well, she sends me things all the time on social media um, and I had to kind of, you know, tempted to block her. <laughs> I'll just say that. But I didn't because um, she just sends me stuff all day long. And, uh, but today I just, for some reason, I, I, I went on my messenger and I checked what she sent me. And um, she's Christian and she's a very, very passionate and zealous person. Um, but I, I read this article and it was the picture that really caught my attention. And it was a picture of a man in Syria with a noose around his neck and he was smiling. I was like, that is a contradiction. Um, and this is what the post, this is what it said on, on Facebook. This Syrian man is smiling with Christ, with Christ's peace in joy to the ones who hate him for preaching the gospel. He knew that his time had come. God was willing to call him home. He knew that in a matter of minutes, he would see Jesus face to face. Oh, the joy to know that his race was over and he was on his way home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. I live for this day. For me to live is Christ and to physically shed my flesh will be greater gain. In this final hour, it is all only and always about Jesus, revealing Jesus, saving more souls. So this man is, is smiling because he knows what's ahead of him. And here's what I want to encourage you. You may be caught up in the race, but I want you to fix your eyes on the prize. Sometimes we can get discouraged in running the race because we forget the destination. 
We just get tired of the race. But this is what it says in the passage. How are we going to do this? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Do you know that he is working, he has initiated your salvation, and he is committed to seeing it through to the end. So the beauty of this race is that he is the one who actually enables you to run. There's a story in the Bible of a prodigal. And when he started to come home, the father, what did he do? He ran out to go get him. When we run the race, we remember constantly that God has run out to us so that we can run for him. Psalm 23, at the end of it, it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What the Hebrew word actually means is, surely goodness and mercy will chase me all the days of my life. Do you know that God's love and his mercy are chasing after you? What motivates us to run the race? It's his mercy and his love and his kindness to us, you guys. So we have to look at our our eyes on Jesus. If you are lonely in these days, you have to know that Jesus had profound moments of loneliness. If you're feeling anxiety, Jesus was so anxious that he, dro- he actually sweat drops of blood. If you have health problems, Jesus suffered the worst form of torture in the world at that time. If you are feeling tempted by the enemy, know that Jesus was also tempted, but yet he never sinned. Jesus understands what you're going through. If he understands, then we can stand. If he suffered for us, we can suffer for him. If he died for us, we can live for him. So I want to encourage you guys tonight, run for your life. Run for your life. Keep going. Keep fighting. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep connecting to one another. Don't stop, don't give up, don't lay down, don't withdraw, don't get pulled into the culture's anger and division. Guard your heart, stay connected. And so my encouragement to you in this next season from September to December, how are you going to run? Because this is a discipline And I want to encourage you guys to join a life group. That is one way that you can still keep running the race. You can join a life group. So you're saying weekly, on a weekly basis, I'm going to sit down with a group of people and I'm going to share my life and be totally honest and we're going to open the word and let it sift through us and purge out the things that are not of God and we're going to seek the Lord in this time and we are going to make prayer a priority Another way that you can stay running in the race is to serve. And Brett mentioned that earlier, is that we cannot just come and worship, but we have to be people who are serving. And there are many ways to be serving in the life of our church during this time. And so just come talk to me about how you can stay running, how you can run the race. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are the God who ran to us, Lord, when we were walking home to you. Jesus, you came and you, your reckless love came into our life and you saved us. When we were down and out, when we had given up, when we were destined for hell, you gave us your son, you gave us heaven. And God, tonight we just remember that the race is so worth running because we know at the end of the race we get you. We get eternal life. And I pray for those who are entangled in sin tonight that you would break every chain, God, in the name of Jesus, that you tonight would be a moment of breaking chains. And God, today we would, God, pick up our cross 
we would enter this race again knowing that you are going to give us the strength to do it. In Jesus' name we pray.